If you want some examples of what I'm talking about, I can give you a hundred, but let me just pick one as an example of what I'm talking about. This pandemic we've just been through, this quarantine we've just been through, we blew it at every level. Preparedness for this quarantine and pandemic, the response to the pandemic and the resultant quarantine, the management, the aftermath, we blew it financially, educationally, medically, psychologically, economically. And what's more, we're still blowing it today. And I'm saying so, and I'm going to say so in detail. I'm going to amplify that by science with world-class experts that have no political agenda. Because if we acknowledge it, we can change it. We can fix it. But if we don't, it's going to cripple this country for decades to come. This current generation that we have in school, these kids that we have in school, you've probably seen the headlines. We just wiped out two years of math, reading, science, all of these different things that kids are supposed to be learning. Well, there's no plan to fix that. We've just started putting kids back in schools that they should have never been taken out of to begin with. And we're going to dig into that. We're going to talk about that. And I'm going to show you what I mean. Because we didn't need the government in here telling us what to do with our own children. If you want another example, school shooters. You notice I said shooters, not shootings. We know so much more information about who these shooters are than we're using that it's just terrible. We need to stop politicizing it and do what we can to manage it. Now, we can have people go argue about the Second Amendment all they want to. That's fine. But there are already more guns on the street than there are Americans. There are thousands and thousands of assault rifles on the street. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about who the shooters are. And there are things we can do to cut down this tragic trend dramatically and we can do it right now, one, two, three, four, five steps that we can take to change this right now if people will just shut up and listen long enough to hear what it takes. That's what I'm talking about. That's what you want to know, that your kids can go to school and be safe. We know how to make them more safe. We can't make this go away, but we can slow it down That's what I'm getting a lot of questions about, and there are answers to that. And I have relationships with the top experts in the world on how to make this happen. You're concerned about what your children are being taught in school. I understand, and you should be. The National Institute of Literacy says there are 32 million people in America that can't read above the fifth grade level. 19% of high school graduates can't read. How do they get through high school? The National Assessment of Educational Progress says 32% of fourth graders and 24% of eighth graders can't read beyond even the most basic level. Why is that? We've got all this controversy going on about changing pronouns with kids that don't even know what a pronoun is. I think we should spend at least as much time making sure they know what a pronoun is if we're going to be talking to them about changing their pronouns. If they want to do that, that's fine, but let's make sure they know what it is. I'm very concerned that we're moving into a victimhood culture. And culture is the operative word here. We are, by rewarding bad behavior, creating a culture of victims. You know, historically, victim was defined as one who is injured, destroyed, or sacrificed under any of various conditions. And 
listen, that happens. I'm not disputing that. There are undisputed victims of circumstances, totally outside anyone's control, that would be consensually acknowledged. I mean, think about it. People that go through hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and the like. These are events that can injure or destroy people's lives. They can be killed, financially ruined, wiped out. These victims of circumstances don't have common personality traits. They just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And many might call them survivors as opposed to victims. They're also victims of human-to-human types of harm, bullying, assaults, slavery, genocide, horrific tragedies like the Holocaust, war, things like that. But in my opinion, this victim label has been hijacked and appropriated by today's society. Research tells us, especially among some, but not all, that were born after 1985 and raised by what are called concierge parents, they started to claim that they've been injured by words or ideas. Injured. Now, that's important because they've medicalized it and actually gotten people fired for hurting their feelings. When I say concierge parents, you know, we've all heard about free-range parents and helicopter parents that hover over their children and don't let them get out there and experience life. And concierge parents are the ones who always caught little Johnny or Jill before they fell and scraped their knee and made sure that they all got a big shiny trophy on their 0-12 soccer team that never won a game, and they celebrated every loss with a pizza party. They bulldozed away any obstacles so they never built up any immunity to social discord. They were never allowed to be teased or excluded or picked on even a little bit, so they never built up thick skin. They never learned how to be tough. Kind of like the princess and the pea. The princess was so sensitive that even a pea would be painful. These are the parents that go out and demand equal playing time for their little boy, even if he can't hit the ground with the ball. Forget that a lot of other kids worked really hard to win. They're so thin-skinned and protected that now they're showing up at college and saying their feelings were hurt, that they've been offended, and they're actually getting professors and deans and coaches fired for hurting their feelings. Those are not students that are prepared for functioning in the real world. I'm concerned about that. What happens if they suffer the inhumanity of some university or organization expecting them to actually do the work or job for which they were admitted to that college or hired at that organization instead of just providing them safe spaces? I mean, come on, what are we doing here? Obviously, I'm not sensitive to a fan of this line of thinking. Comedians used to go to universities because they were open-minded and found humor. Now comedians won't go to universities because they say they're so uptight that they give them a list of things they can't talk about because they would be offensive. So comedians actually don't want to go to colleges. They don't want to go through the list of things they can't talk about. We're turning things upside down. This is a competitive world. And you guys are asking me, what, what am I doing sending my child to a university if they're not preparing them for the real world. Well, I agree with you. Life is not a success-only journey. We need to call that out. Misery is not a strategy. <laughs> it's, not a way, it's not a way to go through life. Taking personal responsibility, strategic planning, goal-directed behavior, that's a strategy. 
our kids should be getting taught that. 